Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you very much to those of you who have uh, decided to tune in. Um, it's uh, on, on one level a real pity for me obviously that I can't actually be physically with you in, in, in uh, California. I think certainly the weather would be better. Um, uh, but hopefully uh, in the next year or next 18 months or so, we may find a way in which we will be able to, 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 to travel and see each other again. But in the meantime, we take advantage of the uh, beauties of Zoom to uh, be able to connect with each other on, a, on multiple time zones. And uh, today I'm very pleased to be able to come and talk to you a little bit about um, uh, a book which um, I wrote actually many, many years ago. It's actually one of the first things I wrote really about uh, the, the nature of the Islamic Republic and the politics of managing change, uh, titled here, as you see, Iran, Islam and Democracy, and uh, which recently came out in a third edition. And it gave me the opportunity to really sort of think and reflect a little bit more about the ideas uh, that I outlined in that text and what it said really about the possibilities of change, the possibilities of political change, but also the problems that are inherent in political change in Iran. And I try also in this, this latest edition to take a, a slightly longer view of, uh, of, of, the, of the structure of politics and the, and, and, and the way in which the Iranian state has worked and how you know, different people have also looked at the way in which they can, uh, um, at which change might, might, might take place. Um, there's been obviously lots of books written about Iran, lots of books written about the Islamic uh, Republic. I don't make any claims for being, you know, uh, having solved the riddle in that sense. All I'm trying to do in a, in, in a sense is to look possibly in a different way at the way in which uh, uh, politics and the state works, state and society works in Iran. And I'll look at some of the more traditional ways and I'll look also at the, you know, uh, some of the ways that I've sort of tried to apply it, particularly at the Islamic Republic, to see really what makes it tick. Um, you know, we can talk about it in quite descriptive terms in terms of the, you know, the different factions and, and, and the different ways in which political groupings work. Or, you know, we can look in a sense, what I, what I like to say is, you know, if you look beneath the surface and really see what really drives uh, uh, the political process in Iran and the prospect of uh, political change. As I've put in the sort of the abstract, I think, that came with this, I've applied both uh, concepts from... Uh, both uh, the German sociologist Max Weber, uh, beg your pardon, the German sociologist Max Weber, and um, uh, obviously the writings of Karl Marx. And, you know, one of the issues that all students of Iran have actually is, you know, can we realistically apply uh, concepts that are really born of a different culture, a Western culture into Iran? Um, how do they work? And one of the, the beauties of it is because Iran has such a thriving and febrile, in a sense, intellectual environment, that actually both these ideas of uh, uh, Weber in terms of patrimonialism, which I look at, but also Marx when I look at uh, ideas of uh, uh, mercantile capitalism in particular, that you can apply them in the sense because the Iranians themselves have tried in some ways to apply and use and, 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 and develop these ideas. So there is a way, there is a means and ways of, of, of really transferal of these ideas, uh, particularly when you look at the way in which the Iranians have also sought uh, indigenously in a sense, domestically, internally to try and uh, drive these ideas. So really rethinking in a sense, the nature of the Iranian states, I like to go back and strip it back because obviously when you're looking at uh, the modern Iranian state, the modern Islamic Republic, but also the monarchy that preceded it, it can be sort of look in terms of the of its of, of its uh, the modern paraphernalia that, that surrounds it, it can look quite complex and there are various sort of different parts of the equation. And sometimes I like to sort of strip back and have a look at, you know, what the basic elements of the Iranian state um, uh, were, what were seen to be the problems and the possibilities even in the 19th century. And I was always struck by a particularly nice vignette that turns up um, in an encounter between um, a British ambassador from the East India Company, as it happens, to Iran in about 1800, when he's uh, discussing the nature of politics with the, the then Rajah King, Fat Ali Shah. This does not show uh, Sir John Malcolm, it has to be said. This shows Harford Jones, but nonetheless, hopefully the picture will, the painting gives you a certain sense of this. And what you had, what, what's interesting about this encounter is that Fat Ali Shah inquires uh, from John Malcolm about what the system of government is in Britain. And he says, you know, in a very sort of casual way, he says, you know, the, the way you describe it, um, your king is nothing more than the first magistrate. Uh, and he really doesn't have any power. You know, I mean, what, what does he do? He simply, he arbitrates various things. Um, and the term magistrate, of course, gives the notion that he's in some ways a, a, a servant of the law. 
And Malcolm, of course, responds that that's absolutely right. That's all that, you know, King George III is. Uh, the king, you know, is limited uh, by the constitution, in a sense, that operates in Britain. And Fafadi Shah, reflecting on this, sort of says, well, that's all very well and good, but it doesn't sound to me like he has a lot of fun. He says, in, in my kingdom, he said, I have a lot of fun and I can do lots of things that your king can't. It is true, he says, that your kingdom will have stability and in, in, in a, a certain sense of certainty in the future, whereas my kingdom will not have stability. He says, when I die, my sons will fight over the inheritance and it will be chaotic. But he says, I suppose the good thing is, hopefully the best one will win and, and, and that will you know, strengthen the kingdom in the long run. And of course here, even Malcolm was saying, here is a sort of a fundamental distinction, a fundamental division of, of uh, uh, a view in a sense of you know, how the state should work. And, and, and you know, what the purpose of the state was. What you had in Iran basically in the 19th century was a very sort of what we might term a pre-modern state around the personality of the ruler. We could even call it in some ways under the Rajah monarchy in the early days, a patriarchal structure rather than even a patrimonial one in the sense that there was a very limited bureaucracy and that actually Fat Ali Shah in particular and almost in creating his own family uh, governed through sort of kinship ties on a, on a vast sense. But in theory, at least also, he had a lot of arbitrary power. I mean, he was basically considered to be absolute in his kingdom, even though in practice, of course, this was not actually true. But nonetheless, he did that. And there was a huge amount of what should we call insecurity of tenure, even among bureaucrats. So the idea of speaking truth to power, it was always a bit dangerous if you decided to do that. I mean, these were part of the problems in terms of the way in which you know, the stability of the state go, uh, would be harmed. And many Iranian reformers, of course, in the 19th century began to really imbue the idea that in order to begin to transform the state, you had to apply things like the rule of law and, and develop a constitution, something to constrain the limits of, of, the, um, uh, of, of the absolute monarch. But how do you do that? I mean, in the 19th century, of course, it was a very, very, you know, for, for most of the century, very little happened. The king or the kings that were governing at the time had no interest really in indulging in political reform of any sort, which they thought would be um, uh, 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 contrary to their own interests and, and, and ultimately um, would undermine them. And of course, this is um, exactly, I suppose, what happens. And what happens is that you have, at the beginning of the 20th century, one of the first big sort of, almost what you could call it an epistemological break to, to quote, uh, uh, um, who was I was gonna quote, to quote Althusser of all people, I haven't quoted him for a very long time. Uh, this sort of moment when Iran sort of launches itself onto a sort of constitutional path, uh, really through uh, managing that sort of process of change. It has to do this because it finds the challenge of modernity, the challenge of the West, something that it needs to, to cope and deal with. And it does this really by bringing together different pillars of the political establishment and bringing these pillars in a sort of a, 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 a unity. And these, of course, in very traditional terms, as, as we understand it, the pillars of the bazaar, the ulama, the elements of the aristocracy. And you can add to that, if you want to have them as a separate category, although it doesn't always work, the sort of the... the um, uh, intellectuals who sort of all ferment and, and basically get together and collect to be able to oppose the monarchy. One of the ideas that basically sustain the monarchy and sustain the monarchy with, without, an, without the tools of sort of absolutism was to keep all these units divided, was to keep these pillars of the sort of the political state in a sense divided. The truth of the matter is, as they began to understand collective action and to come together, they were able basically to force uh, uh, the monarchy uh, to heal and to impose uh, a, a constitution. This absence in a sense of an army, of course, allowed them in a, uh, uh, that, that possibly to do that. But also um, we shouldn't underestimate the role in some ways that both Western ideas had in this, but also in practice during the period, of course, what the British did, as we can see in this picture of the Bast in, in the British embassy in Golhak, how they also facilitated before they, they let it obviously within a year abandoned the constitutionalists, but initially at least facilitated the, 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 the development of that change. And that sort of structure, that sort of the, those different pillars are, are sort of quite in, you know, when we're looking at the notion of change, when does change happen? How is change imposed on, on the state? The state has that sort of that, that, that authoritarian sort of structure in a sense. Uh, the state has to concede ground when those elements of the political, uh, the political elite, if I can call them that way, come together to impose change um, upon, uh, upon the monarchy. But what you do see ultimately is uh, the development through the 20th century 
despite this sort of constitutionalism of uh, even more of a sort of a, a, a patrimonial structure. So the patrimonial structure you have in the 19th century is reinforced in the 20th century. This powerful, personal, almost like autocratic movement in a sense is reinforced in the 20th century by the tools of modernity, if I can put it that way. So the Pahlavi state as it develops post-1925 begins to bring with it basically those tools of, 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 of the modern state, the bureaucracy, the army, so on and so forth. And what you could arguably see is the transition from a patriarchal state, in a sense, to a patrimonial state as properly understood by Weber. This basically looks at one aspect, you know, one way of understanding the nature of the state and, and, and um, uh, how it might change it and how, how it might evolve. Now, Weber says in his writings, you know, when he's talking about patrimonialism as a, as a traditional form of authority, of course, he says that actually the, the, the really revolutionary moment in, um, uh, in, in a patrimonial system, the real moment when you can really invoke or impose a series of change is when there is charisma. And chariz charismatic authority has a way of basically punching through those traditional structures and establishing a new order. And in Iran, in the late 20th century, certainly we have two movements in this way. One arguably um, sort of a created one in the sense of the white revolution where the Shah himself des the decides to, 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 to take on the mantle of a revolutionary monarch in that sense. But that reordering of the Iranian state where he seeks to basically push through changes, the Shah no longer simply uh, manages the state, the Shah wants to now change the state. He wants to push through very fundamental reforms to that state. And he does so by developing a sort of a, what I call there, and I think actually, you know, um, I don't know if uh, I'm certainly borrowing this idea, but you know, the, the, this notion that, um, you know, what he does is he actually uh, reorders those, those aspects of the political elite, removing those elements that are seen as problematic to him, particularly, uh, among the sort of landed aristocracy and really governing at a much more what we would call a Bonapartist type of system where he is the autocrat, an autocrat that reaches out really over and above the political elites to uh, the people themselves. So that's a sort of a, you know, what you could even describe almost as a, as a, as a form of sultanism, but really a, a, a patrimonialism reinforced by uh, a diff, uh, you know, a, a, a much, much more um, uh, radical reordering of the, of, the, of the political elites. And of course, you know, that causes problems for him, as we know. Uh, I don't want to go into the huge detail about the causes of the Islamic revolution itself, but the very elements that come together in 1906 to basically impose change on, on the Raja Shahs then, then come together to really impose change on Muhammad Reza Shah by 1977-78. And that's basically the ulama, the bazaar, where the money is, and then obviously the intellectuals, whether they're from the left and, and also uh, elements of the aristocracy, because one of the things about the white revolution, of course, is that it, it in seeking to reorder that, that, uh, uh, that frame of reference, that sort of political structure, he sought to basically go over the heads and eliminate the sort of landed aristocracy as a political force to emasculate them. And often we forget, actually, that in the Islamic revolution, actually, one of the groups of people, one of the classes in a way that very much welcomed the Islamic revolution and Khomeini were many of the sort of disenfranchised, uh, emasculated sort of like landed aristocracy who thought that actually what Khomeini was going to come and do was to restore um, uh, uh, the old order. And again, that, that's an interesting point in itself because the Islamic revolution is often seen as this real uh, uh, change in the, in the political structure of the country. It's a revolutionary moment. And of course, the closer that revolutionary moment is to us, um, the more traumatic and the more consequential we think it is. I happen to be of the view, by the way, which is not necessarily a popular view, that the constitutional revolution of 1906 was a much more emphatic and uh, uh, consequential political change to the country than the 1979 Islamic revolution. But, you know, that can be obviously debated. But my point is, is in the sense that what you see in 1979, in some ways, is much more elements of continu continuity than change than we think. And one of those is that change and sort of that charismatic movement that the Shah had wanted to start and was then inherited by Khomeini, but also was this notion of patrimonialism, in a sense, about the sort of the, the authority of that one individual. So instead of the, um, uh, the crown, you have the turban, to take the title of uh, Amir Ajman's book. So here with the Islamic Republic, what do we have with the Islamic Republic that is uh, 
th that is for me quite interesting and where I'll get into some of the detail of some of the thoughts I had. You'll see here that the picture I have of the gentleman on, the, on, on, on your slide is Ali Akbar Hashimi Rafsanjani. And that might, you know, surprise some people when they say, well, why don't we have a picture of Khomeini on there instead of Rafsanjani? For me, the real founder of the Islamic Republic is, uh, is Rafsanjani. It's not Khomeini. Khomeini, when he obviously the overthrow of the monarchy, the establishment of the Islamic Republic. But of course, the country then is in sort of a period of revolutionary turmoil, effectively, and then war. And the war is, you know, basically delays any political settlement for about eight years. And in, in many ways, the sort of the, the, the fractious nature of the post-revolutionary establishment is held together by this sort of charisma of Khomeini, who's able to sort of keep things uh, together with a mixture, obviously, of, you know, coercion, charisma, whatever, and all the, all the different elements, but also the basic realisation that people are at war and, uh, um, you know, people are willing to put up with a lot when, when, when the country's at threat. But with the Khomeini's death in 1989, the establishment of what one of my colleagues, uh, Anusha Tashami, calls the, Isla the, the Second Republic. Um, here we have, you know, Raf Sanjani, who was Speaker of the Parliament, then becomes President. They encourage a change in the Constitution in 19, uh, 1989, an amendment which basically eliminates uh, the position of Prime Minister, gives mu much more executive power to the President, which, lo and behold, is him. And uh, of course, adds a very interesting uh, caveat to the notion of the uh, jurist, the Vela Tefari, in which they term it Motlare, the absolute Vela Tefari, which is a, a, a distinction beyond what Khomeini had uh, during his own constitution. So the, these are interesting uh, developments, uh, and certainly for the in terms of Vela Tefari, it has consequences later. Initially, what Rafsanjani uh, wanted to do was to establish a new political settlement. And ironically, what he does in some ways, as he was sort of taunted by his critics, is that he really, in some ways, it reestablishes the old order that the monarchy had in terms of a, a, a very authoritarian presidency, a, uh, a presidency that's defined, in a sense, by uh, personal control. And what's curious about this is how um, uh, uh, Rafsanjani, in many ways, uh, emulates, if I may put it that way, some of the aspects of the Shah's uh, policy. So, you know, looking back, if you were to look back on the, uh, the, the, the nature of reform in Iran, there have often been two ways in which people see that, you know, two processes in which people see can, uh, change can take place. And one of it is basically political change and the other very simply is economic change. And in the 19th century, of course, many of the sort of reformers at the time said that the real problem with Iran is political. It's not economic. You can get other things in order when you get the politics sorted out. The politics needs to be sorted out. And it's got nothing to do with the people. I mean, this is one, one of the interesting things of the 19th century assessment. Even British observers in the 19th century said there's nothing wrong with society per se. It's not the problem. It's the fact that there is the absence of the rule of law and there's an, ab you know, the political system does not encourage, uh, in a sense, the best out of people. Under Muhammad Reza Shah, uh, one of the things that was really emphasized much more, and I wrote about this in one of my books, was really this emphasis on economic, you know, economic led change. So you, you, you economically reform and the politics will follow. It's actually, in many ways, a very American way of, of, of encouraging uh, reform for various reasons. But, you know, that had problems, as we saw, you know, in 1978, you know, obviously things weren't well, you can have as much economic reform as you want, but if you don't match it with political reform, um, it, it can often come unstuck. And ironically, for me, I mean, one of the striking things about uh, Raf Sanjani is he decided to revert to this idea that we leave the politics to the side for the time being, because it's just too complicated, it's just too difficult. Let's focus on economic change, and the politics will come with it. And so what you have, actually, is that despite the sort of charisma of Khomeini, if I can put it that way, what emanates from the, uh, the consequence of that charisma is really a return to patrimonialism. What Weber says about charisma is charisma is the great revolutionary force, as I said, in, in patrimonialism, but that it can result, interestingly enough, in two different types of development. It can either uh, uh, result in a sort of a legal rational model of, of authority, I, you know, what he would term a sort of a modern system of government, or it can revert back to the sort of patrimonial structure of government, which is highly personal, divide and rule, um, legally ambiguous, to say the least. I mean, legally, it's, it, it doesn't, you know, there, there's no clarity in the law, things can change a lot. Now, this is precisely in a sense what uh, Raf Sanjani does, he sort of, he, he, he basically reestablishes this, this sort of um, 
uh, patrimonial system of government. Of course, by the end of his tenure, you know, people, the critics about him would call him Akbar Shah, you know, because they said, you know, he's he's beginning to emulate the, the Shah and the way he, he behaves and acts and so on and so forth. And the political change that people were expecting in the 1990s wasn't really materializing. But the other aspect of the dynamic, which I thought was quite interesting also, and this is why, again, I've linked it to Rafsanjani, was the importance of this, you know, what I have termed in the book and what I described as this mercantile capitalism and the idea of the Islamic Republic actually not really as a, 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 an Islamic Republic at all, but actually much better defined as a, a, a mercantile, you know, a, 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 a mercantile capitalist uh, state run by a mercantile bourgeoisie, if I can put it that way. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation because it's not always used. And of course, one of the things that's quite interesting when uh, conceptually we look at the organization of any state is people tend to follow either Weber or they follow either Marx and they take a you know top-down model looking at culture and authority or they look at a bottom-up looking at the economic and social structures. Um, looking at the work of Brian Turner, among others, who basically argued that actually uh, Marx and Weber were simply looking at, uh, at, at, at uh, uh, political organizations from two different sides of the coin, basically, that they were not antithetical to each other. That yes, Weber was written in some ways as a response to Marxist theory, but in actual fact, because they were approaching the same uh, phenomenon from different directions, there was a lot that could be that these two sort of theories these sort of concepts could relate to each other and i found that quite attractive when i was looking at the way in which iran worked and i always remember very vividly when i was doing my field work in iran in the halcyon days back in the 1990s i always remember you know people would talk about iran as an islamic republic and really emphasize the islamic nature of this state and how distinct it was and how strange it was to have this religious revolution in the modern world and yet I was always very struck by how dominant the accumulation of capital was and how dominant the whole notion of uh, uh, certainly of mercantile capitalism was in, in, in Iran. This wasn't a sort of capitalism as we might understand it in the West. It was something different. And it always struck me because many sort of Western businessmen who would come to Iran in the 1990s would talk with their Iranian uh, colleagues. And they might use the same words, by the way, about you know uh, money and all sorts of investment, this sort of thing, but actually mean quite different things. And lo and behold, in, in Marx talks about these two different types of capitalism. And I think for Iran, it's particularly relevant. So for Marx, he says the real revolutionary force is industrial capitalism. Industrial capitalism is about investment. And for investment, you need stability and you need a long term sort of perspective. So what he says about industrial um, uh, capitalism, basically, is that this is really where uh, the, the the capitalist structure of the state begins with investment, it begins with uh, uh, production, and then moves into trade. So you produce your stuff, and then you go off and you trade and so on and so forth. And he says, this is really the sort of advanced form of capitalism. But the early forms of capitalism that were very sort of um, uh, known and uh, were, were sort of common in, say, the Italian city state, the republics of the 15th and 16th century, this he this defines as mercantile capitalism. And mercantile capitalism is, de is defined around trade. And it's built around the concept of trade, which then may move into production, may move into sort of uh, developing um, uh, you know, factories and the like. But it always starts with that sort of mercantile elite. And it's more of a mentality. It's not a class. It's an attitude to the way in which capital is, is, uh, is accumulated. And of course, what they do, in a sense, is that in, in contrast to industrial capital, what mercantile capital needs is, is a lot of flexibility, a lot of ambiguity, a lot of instability, interestingly enough, because instability means prices change a lot and it means big profits. And people like to make big profits very quickly without really people sort of getting involved in knowing the, the, the details. Whereas in an industrial capitalism, you want to invest and investment requires a degree of transparency, accountability and looking forward. And because you have to have confidence in what you're investing in. In a mercantile system, it's actually the, the, the reverse. You don't want any of that. You want large margins. You want to be able to sort of uh, make money quickly and without really anyone interfering. And the curious thing for me is, of course, you know, what um, um, Marx will say is, of course, mercantile capitalism will naturally, in a sense, and is in most cases, evolve into industrial capitalism over a, a period of time. But for me, what I found, I suppose, most interesting about the, the, the political settlement that Rafsanjani established was that essentially what you see here is a relationship, a very sort of um, 
destructive is the wrong term, but it's 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 basically a relationship of um, uh, an, it, not a constructive relationship between patrimonialism on one side and the mercantile bourgeoisie on the other, or mercantile capital on the other. So both of these wings, in a sense, represented you know by different groups and factions or whatever, both of these mentalities, if you will, basically ensure that you have a dominant political culture of basically divide and rule instability personalities you know highly ambiguous and neither side in this equation really wants to assist the other in moving on from the situation you're in so one of the you know one of the one of the problems for me is to try and find a conceptual way in which we can understand how the iranian state can you know in a sense how it develops how it progresses have we which way you want to describe it what are the possibilities of change how do we understand the pos possibilities of managing change but it's precisely the sort of the unhelpful relationship between these two concepts in a sense and these two concepts applied in practice that ensures that change is always structurally very very difficult to handle because one or other side of this sort of unholy alliance if i can use that term basically prevents the other from developing for those tensions are there and you know for me that sort of inherent instability in a sense of the islamic republic is a function uh, of its of, of its political structure it you know when we look at it and we say why you know how do they um how do they survive in a sense in this in this in this state of flux you know one of the arguments is, is that we're thinking about it in the wrong way we're thinking about it from the perspective of a legal, rational, industrial, capitalist state. This is not what we're looking at. Their, their sort of um, ideal situation is a lot messier than ours. And as a consequence of this, what we see is almost like chaotic, they see as opportunity. So it's, 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 it's a different way of looking at it. And I think it's sort of, hopefully, I would say, I mean, I wouldn't say it's definitive or anything, but hopefully would help us sort of understand what it is about the system that, and, and how it works. Now, what are the consequences of this, you know, in a sense for, for Iran? Well, I've sort of hinted uh, at it in, in, in a sense already that the consequences of this are that Iran in many ways has the sort of the, the, um, the paraphernalia, if you will, the, uh, the, 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 all the sort of the, 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 the bits that look of, of the modern state, if I can put it that way. But fundamentally underneath what you have is something which is a lot more uh, ambiguous and a lot more chaotic than, than, than really the, the, the outside, the sort of the, the surface institutions uh, uh, allow us to believe. And what you see basically is that when you're looking at the various aspects of, you know, Iran, Islam and democracy, as the, as the, as the title of the study really was, these different elements that basically operate within Iran, you know, all of them really become, in a sense, subject to these dominant uh, uh, drivers about the nature of power and about how power is maintained, retained and continued in Iran. So, you know, the, 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 the let's take the democratic or republican element of it. Well, the republican element of it is always going to be undermined by the fact that a republican element really demands this sort of notion of the rule of law and the dominance of law. Well, of course, that's not going to happen in a system in which you have this sort of shared relationship, in a sense, between a patrimonial structure, which has since, I should say, moved from the presidency to the whole jurist himself, as this picture might suggest, that the jurist and the absolute jurist has become now the dominant patrimonial governing figure of the system beyond uh, the president, who ironically, in his own way, has become more of a prime minister, despite having, you know, Rafsanjani having abolished the prime ministership. So that is always going to be undermined by that and those attempts to move forward. So when you have basically those uh, challenges uh, to um, the political settlement, be it, you know, when Khatami came into office in 1997 or then after in the Green Movement and other things, what are they looking for? They're looking for a transition from the patrimonial system to what we might term a legal rational system. But of course, that's always hindered by the fact that um, uh, those uh, sort of power blocks within the system, those uh, uh, political structures are going to make any such transition uh, difficult. And then Islam, of course, becomes much more of a, you know, a, a means of disguising, I suppose, some of the uh, inequalities of the system that emerges, um, rather than being something that is a sort of an ethical code uh, that might shape or, 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 or modify 
shall we say, the sort of the, the mercantile capital that's taking place, it in fact makes a sort of a, it, it, it's drawn to the surface of it. So you, you will hear from people, they will say, of course, making money is good, because, you know, let's not forget the prophet of Islam himself was a merchant. So, you know, making money is not a bad thing. I mean, this is the way, uh, this is the way we have to, um, uh, this is the way it becomes acceptable. Of course, these are tensions. There are major tensions in Iran about this, and not everyone will accept these explanations. But it, I was always very struck by how, you know, when Rafsanjani was setting up his political establishment, in a sense, his political settlement, I should say, you know, one of the arguments they had was, you know, let's put this austerity behind us. You know, making money is good because, after all, you know, the Prophet said making money, you know, he was a merchant and it was a good thing to do. So Islam then, in that sense, becomes uh, a little bit of a fig leaf to the. Uh, um, uh, to the wider you know task of accumulating capital in whichever way you can in whichever form and that's why you know corruption is a major issue in contemporary iran i mean it's always been an issue in iran but it's probably worse these days and then of course you know you've got the issue itself of you know how nationalism plays a role in this and i think this is this is quite interesting because at the end of the day you know one of the things one of the ways in which you try to really you know when you find that you know, your democratic legitimacy in some ways is being sort of, how should we say, uh, undermined. And there's a, a falling away of a sort of an adherence to Islam per se, because people see it as being muddied by by the various uh, wider activities of the of, 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 of mercantile capital, if I can put it that way, then you are sort of result in basically appealing to very, very stark nationalist tropes uh, to try and keep people together. And of course, you know, Marx has very good explanations for nationalism in that, in terms of a sort of a, a bourgeois ideology. So, you know, what you can see is that, you know, if we could make the distinction between patriotism and, uh, and nationalism, um, I'm not sure it's always a useful distinction, but let's make it for the, the here. What you find in Iran, in a sense, is an almost like explicit use of, 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 you know, what I would term in some ways very, very vulgar nationalism. And so <clears throat> in terms of state and society, I mean, what we're seeing here is really um, a, 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 almost a stark distinction between uh, these two, you know, a modern state should have a much more integrated uh, relationship in a sense with its society. What you have now actually is almost uh, uh, um, a, a division between state and society that one arguably could say goes back to the 19th century. And in many ways, the structures that we have and the problems that we had in the 19th century are um, uh, replicated, albeit with, with different paraphernalia in the 21st century. And that nationalism, I suppose, is, is, is one thing that I think for me at the end of the day is, is, is one of those motives for change that might be quite interesting looking forward. Um, this is a quote from Paul Ricoeur, who I, I used quite widely in, in, in a number of my studies, and really looking at that sort of uh, role of um, uh, myth in grounding a society. And what I find quite interesting, I suppose, about that notion of political change is, is there's two things that are that are uh, particularly relevant, I suppose, for us. One is the, ex the the power that the constitutional revolution has, in the 1906 constitutional revolution, of course, has in within the political fabric of the country to this day. I mean, it's it's very interesting how um, whenever people are talking about the possibility of change, they continue to revert to the period of 1906. And in many ways, in terms of uh, thinking about political change, it still traces itself, its lineage, its intellectual lineage to those times. And I find that, you know, particularly interesting. But the other one, of course, as I said, is that use of nationalism. And it's this idea that the tensions that are created within that sort of rather uh, unstable political system, in a sense, uh, are in their own way, then tied together by a sort of a harking back to myth and history or mythical history, if I may put it that way, although people themselves also, as this wonderful picture uh, represents, also start to, in their own way, um, reshape their own memory, their own history and their own myths and understanding. And it's through that, in a sense, that we might see that, you know, the, the change that might come uh, will come really from a from a, a, a social basis, just as it had done in the 19th century. Um, but this is sort of a, a broad outline. I appreciate there's a bit of a gallop through what you know, is, is a fairly detailed um, uh, uh, study in many ways. I'm very grateful, as I said, again, to uh, uh, Roma and Franco and Abbas in particular for having allowed me to come and waffle on about this for a little bit and uh, to review it and to think about it. It's, it's something that fascinates me, really, that possibility and, and of change, but also the, the problems within it about how you transition, in a sense, to a much more um, stable I think environment 
which I think ultimately would be in the interests uh, of, of the Iranians themselves. So I will stop there. Um, I think probably uh, I should stop sharing my screen. Is that right? I think I should. Yes, that would make it easier. Thank you so okay. much, Professor, and sorry, that was great. We do have questions coming in, so I'm going to okay. throw a few your way. One sure. member says, um, what was the role of Dr. Shariati in forming the social structure of post-revolutionary Iran? Well, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate about Shariati's sort of role and views. I mean, I think, I, I, I don't know to what, you know, Shariati is basically held among uh, the left and the sort of more reform-minded Iranians as one of the key sort of uh, intellectuals that shape their idea about the way in which religion and the state should work. I mean, that's what's quite interesting. I, I'm not as, you know, I think what's interesting about Shariati, and I would say there are probably a number of people on this call that know this better than me, I have to say, so I'm treading on, 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 on very thin water here. But my reading of it really is that Shariati had a certain appeal because of the way in which he he married sort of Islam and Marxism together to provide a sort of a, a revolutionary Shiism, if you will, without really the heavy influence of the clerics per se. So in that sense, he provided a sort of framework for religious resistance, if you will, that wasn't tied to the sort of the 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 um, the. the the organization of the clergy itself. I mean, he's had a bit of a, you know, mixed reputation, for that very reason, he's had a bit of a mixed reputation, obviously, within the Islamic Republic, because obviously those who are much more uh, supportive of the concept of Vela Tefari and stuff uh, find um, uh, Shariati to be a much uh, a problematic figure. I don't think he's particularly relevant in the sense of the political structures of the country, but he certainly is relevant to the way in which people think about uh, the way in which uh, uh, state and society should work. Thank you. How do you think that Iran's mercantile capitalism has affected the Weberian authority of the Islamic Republic's supreme leader? Well, this is interesting. I mean, thank you for that question, because I mean, it's something that I always have to try and think about. And, and that's, you know, for me, the, 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 the patrimonial um, uh, system depends obviously on certain groups supporting it, but maintaining a certain division between those groups. But it, it, it's a sort of an alliance of interests. And I think, you know, the mercantile uh, capital in that sense, the what the patrimonial role that originally, I suppose, Rafsanjani took on, but now the Supreme Leader has in that sense, was to maintain in an environment where um, the, these, you know, the mercantile capital can continue to make accumulate capital without interference. I mean, that, that's basically the deal. And then in return for that, of course, that group or those elements of that group will help fund basically the, the, the power of the patrimonial ruler at the time. So in that sense, the Supreme Leader benefits in some ways from the, you know, the, the capital that's accumulated by others. And you see this with, you know, I mean, just even the structure of the, the, the modern Islamic. So a lot of, I mean, what's quite interesting is a lot of them have, you know, uh, at least aspire to very uh, austere sort of lifestyles. But if you look a little bit deeper at the extended families, of course, they're all involved in some form of business, um, be it import businesses, be it, you know, uh, 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 building or whatever, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, property and this sort of thing. So it's, 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 it's interesting how one sort of protects the other and the other effectively, how should we say, funds or supports, you know, the, that, that structure. They have a vested interest in keeping each other there, basically, because it serves each other's interests to do so. Thank you. You mentioned that the position of president was first given more power, later becoming even less than a PM. What do you think of the recent calls for making the president even less influential? Some clerics are calling for a young revolutionary being put in that position to essentially serve as a clerk who carries out the Supreme Leader's directives. Well, again, it's interesting, you know, these are one of the things about Rafsanjani's sort of reforms that I, I think also, you know, it's the law of unintended consequences or, you know, Murphy's law in that sense. So Rafsanjani comes in, the original constitution of the Islamic Republic is basically modeled on the French Fifth Republic with heavy elements of, you know, obviously the, the Islamic government thrown in. So you have a president, beg your pardon, a prime minister, and the prime minister is basically the executive authority. And uh, um, up until obviously the death of Khomeini, that's basically how it was. And then what Rafsanjani does is he eliminates the um, position of prime minister and um, uh, reinforces the executive position of the president. And the idea was really to give himself more, you know, to accumulate in a sense more sort of executive patrimonial power within his own, uh, within his own person. Of course, the irony of that is, is what it's done effectively, is it's uh, 
as power has increasingly moved over the last two decades towards uh, the office of the supreme leader and the supreme leader himself that the president itself then becomes less of a sort of an uh, how should we say autonomous uh, or independent actor and more an executive actor i mean basically they say he's the chief executive so you know in that sense you know harmony is the chairman uh, with oversight and you know the president then becomes the chief executive officer with very you know but but, but with probably less clout than a, a CEO, I have to say, you know, someone who basically does ex executes. I mean, there was this long debate, uh, particularly with hardliners in Iran, who used to say, well, actually, the president is simply there to execute the ideas and the policies that come from elsewhere. And I think, you know, one of the ironies of this, of course, is, as you quite rightly say, what you've seen recently is this debate that actually you should abolish the uh, role of president altogether and go to a parliamentary system where the parliament then elects the um, uh, effectively what would do a prime minister, you know, on a sort of a British system, and uh, they would then serve, you know, the, 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 the office of the supreme leader that becomes a much, much more, you know, classically uh, based almost, you know, monarchical system effectively, you know, as, as you would have found in 1906. I mean, it's a wonderful turn of it. I don't know whether there's much chance of that happening in the near future, but it's certainly being discussed and it sees basically this reduction in the uh, the sort of independent authority, shall we say, of the of, of, of the president, increasingly down to the role of what would ex in practice be a prime minister. Thank you. How successful would you say the Islamic Republic has been in creating its own mythical history and to, cha to challenge that constructed by the Pahlavis? Um, I, that's a fascinating question. I mean, I think in, they, they've been... Uh, less successful than I think they think they are. Let me put it that way. And part of the reason for that is because of the way technology works as well. So, you know, gone are the days when the, you know, the, the autocrat at the middle or the authoritarian government can basically dictate what the, the written history and other things are and, and, and propagate those. Now, they have a very, very effective machine at rewriting history as far as possible and uh, whitewashing elements that they don't want to be... Um, uh, they don't want to be repeated. There have been some, incidentally, some excellent articles written about this. Um, the way, you know, school textbooks and others are sort of rewritten to sort of exclude certain things, to emphasize other things, to, to basically emphasize the way in which the clerics have been at the center of all, you know, emancipatory movements in Iran's history, so on and so forth. Um, the interesting thing, though, I mean, I suppose on, on the, the whole reversal of the Pahlavi myth is that, you know, when you get to President Ahmadinejad, um, one of the fascinating things for me is the way in which Ahmadinejad himself actually resuscitated many of the uh, myths of, you know, uh, the historical myths that the Pahlavis used. So, um, you know, one of the interesting things is the whole business of the Cyrus Cylinder uh, and the whole cult of Cyrus in Iran. So Cyrus the Great is very much, you know, seen as identified with the last Shah. I mean, we remember the, the ceremonies at Persepolis and the parade and all this sort of thing. And the Shah was very emotive about Cyrus the Great. And of course, the Cyrus Cylinder is, is lent by the British Museum uh, to Iran. Ahmadinejad also makes a big deal out of this. I mean, Ahmadinejad also has this fascination with the Archimedes. He also develops this fascination with Cyrus the Great in a different way, of course. He tries to sort of uh, recruit Cyrus the Great to the service of the Islamic Republic. But nonetheless, it's also a, a resurgence of that sort of nationalism. And what I find quite interesting about that process in some ways is that it's interesting to think, has the Islamic Republic or have the authorities in the Islamic Republic developed this of their own accord or are they responding to something that's happening in society that they need to, to basically have an answer for. And I think it's a bit of both, actually. I think it's a realization at the end of the day that uh, there is a movement at a social level which is very keen on this sort of ancient history and the narratives of, 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 of ancient Iran, and they need in some ways to buy into it. I don't think they've been as successful as they, as they think they have, partly because it's very difficult to control these things these days. Uh, and I think, but I think it's one of the most fascinating developments in, in, in contemporary Iran, to be honest. Thank you. One viewer writes, you don't touch on uh, civil society movements and the role of women in, in, the, in this talk, but there have been substantial movements, namely the green wave. Can you expand on that? And a similar comment, a viewer writes, you talk of patriarchy and patrimonial power. Many believe an assertive women's movement is a defining characteristic of the last two decades. I think, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. 
and I think that you know one of the one of the aspects of and again you know I apologize for the fact that I'm not going into the sort of granularity that I need to and uh, and certainly you know in the last two decades what you've well I mean even longer than that I mean I would see not only the sort of the growth in civil society but also in the pre-revolutionary period I mean you see not only the growth of different sort of um, um, uh, groups in terms of civil society movements, but also particularly as you know, it's quite rightly said in the last two decades, also, particularly the role of women in providing resistance, I have tended to sort of basically, you know, what I'm really looking at is the deeper, I suppose, structure of what that means in terms of the the, the organization of the state itself. But in terms of opposition to the state, I think that would be absolutely right. And I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's something that I deal with, obviously, in, in, in the book itself. But it's 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 that element of, of of when those social elements can unite and bring pressure to bear. I mean, I remember talking to people during the reform movement itself, again in the 1990s, and when you know, and, and their argument always was that in order for the state to yield, you need to bring a certain amount of unity to those social movements and that civil society in order to be able to uh, to bring a bit of pressure to bear. But of course, you know. In, in the current situation, I mean, it becomes more and more difficult. I haven't really got into that uh, in as much detail as, as as I would like to, partly because of, of, of time limitations, but also because I wanted to take a much longer view, really, of, of, of the nature of the state. But I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, you know, to be honest, you know, one of my favorite stories of the way in which, um, you know, political change is... Uh, um, is, 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 is encouraged is going back to the 19th century with the Barbie revolt, of course, you know, and the Barbie revolt and all the changes that imposed on the way in which women were viewed in society. I mean, I think it's, it's, it, it's largely actually in some ways um, whitewashed out the history and thank God, you know, there have been some very good uh, historians and others who have brought this much more to the fore, the role uh, of women and others, of course, in, 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 in fighting for, for political change. Thank you. Many have referred to Iran as a continued dual power structure. You made no mention of Khamenei, who in many, many views has been the dominant power of this dual structure of power. Um, I didn't go into the, the specifics in that sense, because what I was really talking about, I did talk about the Supreme Leader. I, think. I mean, the point is that there is, you know, there are many different ways in which you can analyze the, the Iranian state. Um, and, you know, one of the ways when I'm giving a talk at times, I'll talk about uh, is the, the Islamic elements, the revolutionary elements, and the Republican elements, and the two wings of the state. And, you know, that's one way of, 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 of looking at it. The way I would identify that, of course, in some ways is, is um, you know, also between the patrimonial and the mercantile elements of the system. That's what I've focused on for this talk. And I wouldn't want to basically give the impression that that is the be all and end all of it. It's not, you know, it's quite true, of course, that you can look at it and read it in different ways. And certainly the tensions between, say, for instance, the concept of Vela Tavari, the concept of um, uh, the, you know, the Republican institutions of government, be it the president at the moment, but also wider civil society. These are other ways of reading the way in which the state works. But I, in a sense, what I was trying to do is to look have a sort of a deeper dive, if I can put it that way, and say, what are these sort of like um, uh, deeper structural impulses in the state? So I, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm neglecting or ignoring those. Those are different layers of the same type of, uh, of argument. Thank you. A viewer writes, since the bazaar was one of the main pillars of changes since the Constitutional Revolution, except the White Revolution, maybe, what would be the next strongest power in the society that can bring changes in the current mercantile capitalist system in Iran? Uh, well, this is sort of like a future look. I mean, I, you know, when you look back um, and you look at the means of change or whatever, I mean, I would like, you know, I, I have to say for me, actually, in many ways, uh, one of the most uh, powerful, powerful drivers for change, but it's very difficult to assess. And it's very difficult to assess when we're looking at it from the ground up. It's just the power of ideas, actually. I mean, I think the power of ideas in these many different sort of sectors of society and how they, um, uh, how they basically influence those different sectors of society. Now, it could be in the bazaar, it could be, you know, in other, it could be the ulama, it could be others. But the fact is, I think those ideas, I think, are, are not as well understood as we would like. Um, and how those ideas uh, impact uh, upon change. So for me, I mean, in a sense, I'm not, I suppose I, I don't see the country in a sense in those, in very well-defined, you know, socioeconomic groups, because in many ways, Iranian society is so fluid, you know, there are people from every different 
class or group you could want it it i think it's much better to understand them in a sense in terms of the ideas that drive them which is why i've i've tried to look at it in the way i have um the dominant ideologies that drive them and i think you know at the end of the day um you know there is an element where you know you one would like to think that uh it would it would um uh, not only come i suppose from from those on the fringes on the margins of the sort of the, the political system but in a sense through the sort of the wider exchange of of ideas that may come i know that's not a terribly satisfactory answer by the way but i don't really want to i i think i would need a a, a much longer answer in a sense than the time i have available to really explore that more fully so maybe offline at some stage if anyone wants to email me i'd be happy to talk about that Thank you. One viewer writes, you have not discussed the role of the military, which must be a major stakeholder in the current geopolitical situation. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, but what what is the military? So let's say the IRGC. I mean, perfectly, you know, the IRGC is a major stake on it. But what do the IRGC do? I mean, the IRGC actually are heavily involved in business. You know, I mean, this is this is what's interesting. If you want to look at the the, the consequences of the sort of a mercantile cap, what are they doing? I mean, they're basically uh, making money. Now, by the way, when we talk about mercantile capital, I'm not excluding the fact that they go and invest and do little things on their own and whatever, but a lot of it's also about import. It's about dominance of certain types of trade, illicit or otherwise. It's about, you know, accumulating uh, money uh, as an organization. And, you know, one of the problems in the modern Iranian Islamic Republic, of course, is the role of the IRGC in many forms of business that uh, arguably it shouldn't have a hand in. But why, why is it doing this? I mean, why is it drawn into this sort of type of... Um, uh, activity. I mean, wh why is the, the the IRGC as a sort of the the premier arm, shall we say, of the of the Islamic Republic drawn so heavily into business? Because that's the raison d'etre of the system, in a sense. I mean, that's that's what it does, and everyone wants a hand in it. So, you know, in terms of the uh, um, coercive power of the state, certainly the coercive power of the state is there. The Basij are there. The IRGC are there. They're absolutely right. Um, but also. You know, in a sense, how are they kept together, how are they bound together, how do they, uh, how do they keep it? A lot of it's through patronage, uh, through you know money, but also through the the sort of farming out of various sort of uh, trade uh, uh, amenities, shall we say, um, to various groups where they can make money without the state, you know, looking on on them. I mean, what you know, if you look at the sort of whole structure of the religious foundations in Iran, one of the big issues about them is nobody really knows what the books are. Nobody really knows what the accounts are. Nobody knows what sort of taxes they might or might not pay. I mean, it's all done in a very fluid, um, uh, um, opaque way. And, and that for me is the, is the mercantile capitalism at work. Thank you. We have lots of great questions and comments coming in. I'm going to try to get to a few more before we run out of time. Uh, one viewer writes, to what extent do you think Rafsanjani was inspired by Deng Xiaoping's approach to economic reform, which did not entail any mass privatization or structural reforms in the political realm? That's an interesting question, actually. I mean, I hadn't actually thought of Deng Xiaoping as a, as a I mean, you know, they do talk about the China model now and then in Iran. I, I in, and Rafsanjani also did talk about it at times. That's absolutely true. Um, but I have to admit, I don't think it was a major influence on what he was doing, because I, I don't think it was as pervasive in the literature, certainly as I remember, but I'm, I'm happy to be proved wrong, actually, if that was the case. I mean, um, certainly now they talk a lot more about the China model, although they're not, I don't think they're entirely uh, clear on what the Chinese have done in that sense. Um, but I, I, I personally, I didn't see the sort of evidence that I would need to say that Rafsanjani took that, the, the Deng Xiaoping as his model. We have lots of other questions. Another viewer asks, do you think that Islamic democracy is the same as liberal democracy? Based on my understanding, you don't see any difference between Islamic society and non-Islamic society other than a couple of minor ethical codes. I don't know how you got to that conclusion, I have to say, but uh, no, I mean, I think there's a there's a there's a very big. I mean, it depends how you define Islamic democracy, of course. I mean, there were two different ways of is defining Islamic democracy and some of the ways that, for instance, philosophers or lay philosophers like Abdul Karim Siruj talked about Islamic democracy. They talked about it in a way that was a bit like saying it was like Christian democracy in, in you know, in, in, in the West or in West Germany or big part in Germany and other places. So it depends how you define it. I mean, obviously, it depends what role you see for Islam within an Islamic democracy. But clearly the sort of the quote, um, you know the 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 democracy that you see 
you know, today being practiced in Iran, I think is a, is a world away from liberal democracy. And I think they would also be proud of that fact. Um, they don't want to be, well, certainly those in, those in power don't want to be considered as, a, as liberal in any way or form. So I think they are quite distinct, quite different. Thank you. One viewer writes, there is a high degree of pragmatism in how political Islam has survived throughout the Middle East. Does this pragmatism erode or undermine the legitimacy of the political structure in Iran? Uh, it depends again, you know, I'm sorry to say on what you mean by pragmatism. I mean, uh, if you mean by pragmat pragmatism that they're able to sort of modify and change their modes of conduct in order to, you know, reflect the reality on the ground, then in some ways that would reinforce their legitimacy actually, because it would mean that what you have is a functioning working, working government and system. Uh, if by pragmatism you mean that they are basically contradicting in a sense, many of the tenets of their, what they would call their belief system, then I think, you know, that would obviously, at the end of the day, um, uh, erode some of the legitimacy. And I, to be perfectly honest, I mean, I think that's what's been happening. I mean, if you look at the, you know, um, uh, religious belief in Iran, it's it's arguably not, certainly not as uh, high as it was in 1979. Um, last quick question, and this might be rather speculative, but a viewer says, yeah. how different do you think Iran would be with the absence of someone like Rafsanjani? That is very speculative. God, who knows? That sort of virtue, that's what they call, was it alternative history or something? Um, I, I honestly don't, yeah, I, 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 I can't give an answer to that, to be honest. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there were some things that, you know, Rafsanjani did, I think, that were very positive in terms of stabilizing uh, the system after the war. I, I think the the curiosity of Rafsanjani is that it's it's also this notion of when you make political changes, you have to make political changes with a view to, you know, almost predicting what might happen when you're not there. I mean, it's it's that sort of thing. He had a number of ideas, which if you at the time were explained in very rational ways about the way in which he wanted the government to work, but of course it actually worked in, in different ways to how we anticipated it would work because obviously people have different vested interests. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's, um, um, it's, it would be difficult to say. I mean, it would be difficult to, uh, to say. I mean, it would all depend on who, who we thought might have come instead of him, to be honest. Very Thank unsatisfactory you. answer, I'm sorry, but not, No, that's great. Thank you for taking all of those questions and comments. Thank you everyone who stayed on the call a little bit late. Dr. Ansari, we hope the next time we see you, we'll be in person at Stanford. Thank you. For yes, I hope so. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening in.